Well, the fact of the matter is, many people have challenged Dr. Knight to debates, and he's never accepted. I personally know David Wood. You, uh, you engaged in what was called fine. Muhammad would engage in a practice called fine when Aisha was six years old. Before he, before she, uh, before he could actually have sex with her, she was too small before then. Uh, before he could actually have sex with her, Muhammad, the greatest moral example, the, the, the example that you Muslims follow, would put his penis between her thighs and ejaculate on her. Put his penis between her thighs and ejaculate on her. And ejaculate on her. Uh, Sam Shamoon. Tell us, why does your God love through breasts and vaginas? You don't have a life. Well, let me send you to back where you can lift the black stone. Hold on, let me send you. Oh, my God! You guys are a cancer to society because you don't worship God but Satan. Jay Smith. Earlier, um, uh, Shabir said that they are able to drink wine in heaven. I find that interesting because when you go back to the Quran in Surah 590 and also Surah 2, 219, it states very, very succinctly that Satan is the creator of wine. Now, why would you have something created by Satan okay, waiting for them in heaven? It does not say that. No, I'm sorry. It says that it is the amal of shaitan. It is the, the work of the shaitan that uses the wine to create enmity and hatred among people. You have to read it carefully. Don't just put it? my scripture in my presence. <laughs> Go read it. <laughs> Mr. James White. Been justified by faith, we have irony, shalom, peace with God. You refer a lot to the book of Hebrews to explain this. Um, it's the longest theme. book in the New Testament that addresses the subject. Yes. Do we know who wrote the book of Hebrews? No, we do not. Hmm. And myself. Um, in Islam, it is well known that Muhammad did not know whether or not he was going to go to heaven. He'd always <laughs> told people, Yes, I'm the prophet, but um, uh, you have to pray for me, pray on my behalf that God will forgive me so that I can return to heaven. We have all challenged. Uh, Zach and Knight to debates and he never responds. There's one thing about Zakir Naik that makes people really think that he knows what he's talking about, and that's when he's able to, to share facts randomly and very quickly from the top of his head in such a manner that makes you think, wow, he is a really intelligent man. But a friend of mine sat down and went through a five-minute talk of his once, and in that five minutes, he was able to make over 25 mistakes. Charles Darwin went on an island by the name of Calatropis. There is no such island as the Calatropist Islands anywhere. It was actually the Galapagos Islands that Darwin visited where he found finches. And there he found birds pecking at niches. These finches do not peck at niches, as Nike says. They lived in separate ecological niches. Depending upon the ecological niches they peck, the beak kept on becoming long and short. The differences Darwin observed between these finches were far more than simply beak length. They included differences in color, size, mating behavior, songs, and preferred food. This observation was made in the same species, not in different species. Darwin's observations of varying beaks were made on 14 different species of finches, not just one, as Dr. Knight claims. The beak length actually did not vary within the species. Charles Darwin wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson. All of Darwin's published correspondence is printed and even available electronically online and it contains no record of anyone named Thomas Thrompton. Charles Darwin himself said that there were missing links. He didn't agree with it. Darwin admitted that there were missing links, but that does not mean he disagreed with his own theory. He simply predicted where the missing links would be found. The reason is because that if you analyze the church, the church was against science previously. The church was never against science. Almost all the great European scientists of Galileo's time, including Galileo, were devout Christians. People like Newton, Copernicus, Kepler, Boyle, Linnaeus, Pascal were all committed believers in the Bible. And you know the incidents that they sentenced Galileo to death. They sentenced Galileo to death. Galileo, a devout Catholic, was never sentenced to death. He was sentenced to life imprisonment on June 22, 1633, 
and then that sentence was commuted to house arrest. He died more than eight years later on the evening of January 8, 1642, of old age. Galileo believed that his theories fit with the Bible, and he wrote a book arguing this based on inter early interpretations of Christians like Augustine. Knight goes on to make the same false statement two more times, but let's only count it as one factual error. So all the scientists, most of them, they support the theory because it went against the Bible, not because it was true. Actually, most scientists did not support Darwin's theory for many years, and most of these same scientists revered the Bible. Basically, this account by Dr. Nike is a total fabrication. All the sages, Lucy, they were four hominides. Everything Dr. Nike says here is wrong. There is no such word as hominides. He must mean hominids. Science tells us that there four hominides. There are not a mere four hominids. There are at least 14. First is Lucy along with his guide, Dastrolopithecus. There is no such hominid as Dasnopithecist. Lucy was an Australopithecus afarensis. Which died about three and a half million years, the Ice Age. The Ice Age was not three and a third million years ago. It was between 1.6 million years and 10,000 years ago. Then next came the Homo sapiens, who died about 500,000 years ago. Homo sapiens did not die out 500,000 years ago. You and I, and even Zakir Naik, are Homo sapiens. Then came the Neanderthal man. According to evolutionary theory, Neanderthal man was not on the direct line to modern man, but an Ice Age offshoot. The Neanderthal man, who died 140,000 years ago. Neanderthal man went extinct 30,000 years ago, not 100 to 40,000 years ago. Then came the fourth stage, the Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon man is the same thing as Homo sapiens, which Nike had mentioned as a different earlier species. There is no link at all between these stages! Actually, evolutionary biologists have found many examples of what they claim to be links between these stages. For example, Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, and Homo heidelbergensis. If you know of Sir Albert Georgi, who got the Nobel Prize for inventing, for inventing the vitamin C, Gergi didn't invent vitamin C, he discovered it. Vitamin C is a naturally occurring substance that doesn't need to be invented. He wrote a book, The Crazy Ape and Man, against Darwin's theory. Albert said Gergi's book was not called The Crazy Ape and Man, but simply The Crazy Ape, and it was not a refutation of evolution, but a sociological commentary. If you know about Rupert Stalbert, this person wrote a new theory of evolution against Darwin's theory. Who is Rupert Albert? I can find no trace of anybody with that name. From the apes. If you know of Sir Frank Salisbury, you are the biologist. Nike quotes one unknown person after another. Who is Sir Frank Salisbury? Again, vigorous searching can find no trace of anybody with that name. But to give Nike the benefit of the doubt, this will not be counted as a factual error. If you know about white meat, Sir White Meat. White Meat? Who is Sir White Meat? For the fourth time, no trace can be found of anybody with this name. At lower level, an amoeba, at lower species level, amoeba can change to paramecia. There is no such thing as paramecia. Perhaps he means paramecium. But the evolutionary change of an amoeba to a paramecium is far more dramatic biologically than the relatively small biological difference between apes and humans. According to Hansus Craig, who is authority in this field, he said it is unimaginable. There is no such person as Hences Crake. Nike probably means Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA. Francis Crick believes fully in evolution.
in the Old Testament, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, in the Hebrew language, it reads, I'm sure Brother Swagat would appreciate it because I thought I heard him say that he knows Hebrew and he knows Greek. In the Hebrew language, it says, Hikko mamittakim vi kullo muhammadim zehdudi vi zehrei bainat Jerusalem. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. The word muhammadim is muhammad im im i am im. Im is a plural of respect in Hebrew. Right? False gods of the nations were called Elohim. Do you think that the children of Israel actually respected these gods? Do you think that God himself respected these so-called gods? Uh, he certainly didn't. There simply is no plural of respect in Hebrew. That's a, uh, a later convention of speech. Uh, it has been read back into the Bible. Uh, it is, uh, yes, Jabir, Elohim is God in Hebrew, and it's used for the true God as well as for false gods. And so the, the point I'm making is if it's a plural of respect, then it would be an indication, uh, then it would be a plural of respect for the false gods just as well as for the true God. Uh, it simply is not a term of respect. And by the way, the I am ending uh, it is not something that's added to uh, proper nouns. For example, you would never see in the Old Testament in Hebrew uh, where Abraham is called Abrahamim, and yet the Jews certainly respected Abraham. You'll never see the Jews refer to Davidim, even though they certainly respected David. Uh, You'll never see them refer to Musa or Musasim because that simply isn't a uh, correct uh, figure, uh, way of describing biblical Hebrew. There's something else that's going on there. Uh, it's simply a plural, and there's simply no way around that.
Terrorist groups like the Islamic State, the Taliban, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and Al-Qaeda is not a UN resolution or the U.S. military. The greatest threat to terrorists is an informed population, because only an informed population can undermine the ideology that gives rise to jihad. With this in mind, let's go through ten facts about the Quran, history's most effective manual for violently subjugating nations and cultures. Fact number one. The word Quran means recitation. The Quran is something that's supposed to be recited from memory. Muhammad and his companions weren't big on reading, and in Muhammad's time, portions of the Quran were only written down as memory aids. It wasn't until later that some of his followers came up with the idea of putting it all together into book form. So, why would Muslims want to recite the Quran? Because, fact number two, Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of Allah. The angel Gabriel, as the story goes, delivered verses to Muhammad, and Muhammad passed these verses on to his followers. But as far as the Quran is concerned, Gabriel and Muhammad were male men. It's the word of Allah, not the words of Gabriel or Muhammad. Why do Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of Allah? Because, fact number three, Muhammad said so. The Quran was supposedly revealed to one man, Muhammad. Unlike the Bible, which contains numerous shorter works written by around 40 different authors, the Quran stands or falls with the lone testimony of Muhammad, a guy whose first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic, a guy who repeatedly tried to kill himself, a guy who believed he was the victim of magic spells that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs, a guy who delivered verses to his followers and later blamed the devil for tricking him, a guy who had sex with a nine-year-old girl, had nine wives at one time, even though the Quran says Muslims can only have four, married the divorced wife of his own adopted son, after causing the divorce, told his followers it's okay to beat their wives into submission, and so on. So, what evidence did Muhammad offer to show that his revelations were from Allah? Fact number four, Muhammad's main argument for the inspiration of the Quran was what we'll call the argument from literary excellence, one of the silliest arguments ever offered by anyone for anything. My poetry is better than your poetry, so my poetry must be the inspired word of Allah. The idea is that no one can produce something as wonderful as or more wonderful than the Quran. Now, there are all kinds of things we could do to make the Quran better than it is. We could take out the verses about slaughtering unbelievers or about raping female captives or about having sex with prepubescent girls. But one simple way to improve the Quran would be to put it in chronological order. Because, fact number five, the Quran is not arranged chronologically. Apart from the first chapter, which is a short prayer, the rest of the Quran is basically arranged from the longest chapters to the shortest chapters. But the longer chapters were generally much later than the shorter chapters, so the Quran is thoroughly disorganized, making it very difficult to read. 
you might not care about the order, but it's actually extremely important because, fact number six, some parts of the Quran abrogate or cancel other parts of the Quran. Later revelations typically abrogate earlier revelations, but since the Quran isn't arranged chronologically, we don't know which verses are canceled and which verses still apply without massive collections of commentaries to help sift through this mess. You'll recall that the Quran's main argument for its divine origin is that it's so incredibly well written. It must be from God. Yeah, it's so wonderfully written that no one can understand what they're supposed to do without consulting a team of scholars. This is my modern take on the Quran. What did Muhammad's contemporaries think of it? Fact number seven. Muhammad's contemporaries were convinced that the Quran was plagiarized from earlier sources. How do we know what they thought about the Quran? We know because the Quran repeatedly tells us that Muhammad's contemporaries accused him of stealing his stories from others. How did Muhammad respond to charges of plagiarism? He declared that, fact number eight, the Quran is a continuation of previous scriptures. The reason so much of the Quran sounded so familiar to the people of Arabia wasn't that Muhammad was plagiarizing earlier sources. Those earlier sources were also the word of Allah. That's why they sounded the same. Of course, Muslims today know that those earlier sources thoroughly contradict the Quran, so they're forced to claim that the earlier sources were corrupted. This is extremely odd because, fact number nine, the Quran was only compiled into a book because much of it was lost. According to Muslim sources, entire chapters of the Quran were forgotten. Large passages came up missing. Verses vanished. This was in spite of the fact that Allah promised, he promised in chapter 15, verse 9, to protect the Quran from corruption. He couldn't do it, which calls into question the rest of what he said. Why is this relevant? Because... Fact number 10, the Quran is the highest authority on matters of Sharia. Raping captives, beating women into submission, chopping off hands for stealing, grown men marrying little girls. These things come from this book, which most certainly is not the word of God. Learn these facts, my friends, and share them with others. If you like the sources for anything I've said in this video, click on the link in the description box. It's all there, waiting for you to do your part in throwing a great big freedom-sized monkey wrench in the jihad machine. And since there's much more the world needs to know about Islam, click on this subscribe button so you'll know when I post my next video, which I assure you will be awesome. When a jihadist slaughters someone in broad daylight, citing the Quran and screaming Allahu Akbar, the point he's trying to make is usually pretty clear. And yet, after almost every terrorist attack in the West, the media and politicians and police announce we're still searching for a motive. Anyone seen a motive lying around in all these strewn body parts? Earlier this week, after two jihadists butchered a British soldier named Lee Rigby on a London street while screaming Allahu Akbar, one of them wanted to make sure his motive couldn't be missed, not even by the media and politicians and police. So he stopped to clarify things for us. Yeah. The only reason we have killed this man today is because m Muslims are dying daily by a British soldier. And this British soldier is one. So British soldiers are killing Muslims in Muslim lands. What does this have to do with killing Lee Rigby? We are forced by the Quran in Surah at Tawbah through many, many ayahs throughout the Quran that we must fight them as they fight us. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was Michael Adabalajo, a convert to Islam and a former associate of Anjum Chowdhury. He's given us two reasons for killing Rigby. One, British soldiers are killing Muslims. And two, the Quran commands Muslims to fight those who fight them. Now, his first claim is obviously correct. British soldiers are fighting at least some people who believe in Islam. But not everyone agrees with his second claim, that the Quran commands Muslims to fight those who fight them. Just ask world-renowned Quran scholar and Islamic theologian, Prime Minister David Cameron. There is nothing in Islam that justifies this truly dreadful act. Well, I can think of something in Islam that would justify the attack. It's called the Quran. In the clip we saw, Adabalajo refers specifically to Surat at tawbah that's chapter 9 of the Quran, which is filled with commands to fight unbelievers. Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who do not 
believe in Allah. Surah nine, verse seventy-three. O Prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and be unyielding to them. Surah nine, verse one hundred eleven. Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Believers, i.e., Muslims. Fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. What did Adabalajo do? He killed someone and then got shot by police. But I'm sure it had nothing to do with the Quran explicitly commanding him to kill and get killed. In the very chapter he cited as his reason for killing and waiting around for police to show up and shoot him. I invite everyone to read chapter nine of the Quran, the last major chapter that Muhammad delivered to his followers. It's basically one long call to jihad and one long condemnation of Muslims who refuse to fight unbelievers. Surah nine, verses eighty-one and ninety-four to ninety-five, even say that Muslims who make excuses for refusing to fight the unbelievers. Will burn in hell, which is probably why Adabalajo said that the Quran forces him to kill. We are forced by the Quran in Surah At Tawbah. Forced by the Quran. Forced by the Quran. Forced by the Quran. Prime Minister Cameron doesn't seem to understand any of this, but maybe Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, has a better grasp of jihad. It is completely wrong to blame this killing on the religion of Islam. Uh, but it is also equally wrong to try to draw any link between this murder and British foreign policy, or the actions of British forces who are risking their lives uh, abroad for the sake of, of freedom. According to Mayor Johnson, Rigby's execution had nothing to do with Islam and nothing to do with the British Army fighting Muslims. Apparently, Mayor Johnson hasn't read Surah five, verse thirty-three of the Quran, which says, "The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and His Apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this: that they should be murdered, or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned." This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter, they shall have a grievous chastisement. What's the penalty for making mischief in a Muslim land? If it's something serious, the penalty is death. Who was Lee Rigby? He was a machine gunner in the British Army. He had a tour in Afghanistan, and more recently, he was recruiting more soldiers to go to places like Afghanistan. By the way, bringing a non-Muslim military into a Muslim land to interfere in Muslim affairs is the most extreme form of mischief making, according to Islam. The penalty is death. The Quran even tells Muslims how to kill in order to spread fear. In Surah eight, verse twelve, Allah declares, "I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Therefore, strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. Strike off their heads and their fingertips. Don't just kill them; mutilate them." But Rigby's beheading and mutilation had nothing to do with Islam, right, Mayor Johnson? How could this be any simpler? There are only two ingredients in this recipe for terrorism: take one cup of the Quran, add a tablespoon of mischief-making, stir together, and wait for the attack. So, Mayor Johnson, saying that the teachings of Islam and British soldiers fighting in Afghanistan have nothing to do with the massacre of Lee Rigby is like saying that flour and sugar had nothing to do with the biscuits you were probably munching on for your afternoon tea while Rigby was being slaughtered like an animal in the city that elected you mayor. The fault lies wholly and exclusively in the warped and deluded mindset of the people who did it. 
Yeah, you and Mr. Cameron are the authorities on diluted mindsets. Do you guys have any strategy at all for dealing with terrorism in the UK? We will never give in to terror or terrorism in any of its forms. You'll never give in to terror? You already have, Mr. Cameron. The moment you decided to protect an ideology that calls for the annihilation of your civilization and the violent subjugation of your citizens, you gave in to terror. Now, if you want to protect Muslims who had nothing to do with the attack, that's one thing that is part of your job description, and I'd be happy to help you protect individuals who don't support jihad, Muslim or non-Muslim. But you're protecting an ideology, one that commands its adherents, whether they know it or not, to brutally murder people like Lee Rigby. Instead of using your position to promote open discussion of this ideology, you use it to tell millions of people that anyone who obeys the Quran's clear commands to kill has somehow betrayed the religion that ordered him to kill. This was not just an attack on Britain and on the British way of life. It was also a betrayal of Islam, a betrayal of Islam, a betrayal of Islam, a betrayal of Islam. There's definitely a betrayal here, Prime Minister Cameron. But it's not a betrayal of Islam. Islam is often presented as a very simple religion. It's just submission to Allah. But if you dig a little deeper, you find out in the Quran, Surah 4, verse 65, that submission to Allah requires complete obedience to all of Muhammad's decisions. And that's where Islam gets a lot more complicated, because Muhammad's decisions are spread across thousands of stories in the Hadith. Most Christians don't have the time, or the sources, or the desire to go through all this material and figure out what Islam teaches. No problem, that's what we're here for. We're happy to serve that role in the body of Christ. But we should all keep in mind that there are more than 1.6 billion Muslims in the world and that Islam places a strong emphasis on preaching and winning converts. Chances are we're not going to be there when your Muslim friends preach Islam to you or when your children go off to college and hear about how wonderful Islam is, not only from their Muslim friends, but also from their professors. It seems then that Christians in general need to know something about Islam. Rather than throw everything at you at once, I'm going to give you three simple verses. Now, I would love to see Christians around the world learn maybe a dozen or so Quran verses that I think are very important. But if I were to narrow down the list to just three verses, these would be the three. First, Surah 4, verse 157. By the way, surahs are basically chapters, so chapter 4, verse 157. This verse gives you the Islamic view of Jesus' crucifixion. Let's read it. They said in boast, they here are the Jews, they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety, they killed him not. Notice that Jesus wasn't killed. He wasn't even crucified. Islam denies that the crucifixion of Jesus ever took place. But if Jesus was never crucified, why do people believe that he died on the cross? The Islamic view is that Allah miraculously disguised someone to make him look like Jesus, and it was this other person who was crucified, not Jesus. The reason you believe that Jesus died, according to Islam, is that Allah did an excellent job tricking everyone. It's interesting to ponder the theological depths false prophets will go to in order to deny what Jesus did for us. Second, Surah 5, verse 47. Muslims often claim that the Bible has been corrupted, but there are plenty of verses in the Quran which show that if the Bible has been corrupted, Allah certainly doesn't know anything about it. 547 is one of these verses. In 547, Allah commands Christians to judge by the gospel. He says, Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. 
If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. Allah commands us to judge by the gospel, and he says that we're rebels if we don't. Clearly, we can only judge by the gospel if we actually have the gospel. So the Quran assumes that we have reliable scriptures. Of course, if we obey Allah and we judge by the gospel, we have to judge that Islam is false because Islam contradicts the gospel. The gospel says that Jesus died on the cross. The Quran, Surah 4, verse 157, says that he didn't. The Quran tells us to judge by the gospel. Therefore, if we listen to the Quran, we have to reject the Quran. Third, Surah 9, verse 29. If you've never understood why Christians and other religious minorities are so horribly mistreated in places like Iraq and Egypt and Pakistan, the reason for the abuse is found in the Quran. Allah commands Muslims, once they are in the majority, to violently subjugate Christians and Jews. Allah says in 929, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day. Notice it says, Fight those who do not believe, not fight in self-defense. This is a command to fight people based on their beliefs. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book. People of the book are Jews and Christians until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Muslims are commanded to fight us until we pay tribute to them and feel ourselves subdued. We have to acknowledge our inferiority and accept our status as second-class citizens who don't have the same rights as Muslims. This command has probably led to more oppression than any other command in history. If you watch my videos, you might already be familiar with these three verses, but I would encourage you to pass this video on to your friends. Islam's most powerful asset in the West, with the possible exception of political correctness, is ignorance. If people don't know anything about Islam, Muslim preachers, along with groups like CARE and ISNA, can say pretty much whatever they want to say about Islam and no one will know any better. But if certain facts about Islam become common knowledge, our discussions with our Muslim friends will be much more productive. So pass this video on, and if you'd like to learn more about Islam, be sure to visit us at AnsweringMuslims.com.
This is Surah 25 verse 54. He who has created man from water, he has he established relationship in league of uh, legend and marriage. You know, this verse, if you read it really, it doesn't say a lot. So you will not understand it until you go deep. Now, what this verse saying? Saying Allah, he created man and woman, uh, or like, you know, uh, our seed, like you have kids from uh, water, which means the sperm of a man. And Allah he established relationship only by marriage. Islam don't don't approve any relationship if it's out of marriage. So this is what the verse is about to tell you that Islam will not approve any relationship it, if it is out of if, of marriage. What relationship mean? If my dad he have me by adultery, I will be the son of adultery, not the son of my dad. This is what the Quran is saying. If my dad he is married to my mom and my mom she got a pregnant, she got me. I am the son of my dad, according to this verse. If my mom she had sex with my dad without marriage, I will be the son of adultery. Then there is no relationship. You see, establish, ha, and then has he established relationship of linked of and marriage, which means a legal marriage, a marriage, not 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 any not any way. There is no other way is approved in Islam. So if you are a son of adultery, you cannot claim that you are the son of that man by any way. Even if, even if you are really by blood, like you can prove it, you can have a, a DNA test, you know, still you cannot get your father's last name, your father, and you cannot inherit from your father, according to Islam, the last name, the money, child support. Why? Because you are a son of adultery. Now, what that mean, O2? What it's mean, it means something scary. Let us go to the explanation of a Qurtubi and we will see how how ugly really is Islam. <clears throat> Al-Qurtubi saying the following. This is Al-Qurtubi now, you know. This is not me saying what, what I'm going to say now. It's disgusting, but he is the number one Imam in Islamic world and he is explaining up to his prophet. He is saying, The Nasab was Sahar Ma'nayan Ya'mani Kulla Di Qurba Baina Adamiyain. You know, the, 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 the marriage, the marriage and the relationship from that marriage is how relation established between all human. There is no relationship and there is no, there is no marriage. So if it is not from marriage, there is no relationship. And he's saying, Qala Ibn al-Arabi, Ibn al-Arabi is one of the biggest reporters of Islam, one of the biggest, the top, you know. Uh, you will see his name everywhere, everywhere you, you go, <coughs> he, and he is approved by all Muslims. So Ibn al-Arabi he said, "An nasabu huwa ibara an khalti al ma'i bina dhakari wal unta ala wajh al shara." The nasab he is the mix between a man and a woman water by legal Islamic law, not out of law. If it's out of law, it means this is not approved. Whatever happened out of it, you, you, the woman she get pregnant, the kid he will not be approved. So it have to be ala wajh shara, which means by Islamic law. If it is not by Islamic law, it's not approved. Then he's saying, so if it's if it if it is in masiyah, which means if it is in adultery, this is will be just a creation, no relation, just a creation, no relation, which means you will not be related to your dad if you are a son of that relation. Now. He continues saying, and now who is the one who's saying that? This is Ibn al-Arabi. This is one of the biggest scholars who explain all Islamic books, including the Quran. And you will see every Muslim scholar have to go by this guy. Everyone. He said, according to his prophet, because of that, because it's out of legal relationship and not approved by Islam, so it doesn't go, it's not going under, the said of God, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ It's forbidden for you, your women, your, 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 your mothers and your daughters. It's forbidden for you, your mothers and your daughters. Forbidden from what? From, from sex. Which means you cannot marry them. You cannot marry your mom, you cannot marry your daughter. Why? Because you have a relationship to them. The first one is your mom, the second one is your daughter. So, he's saying, because the first case, it is not considered as relationship in Islam so if you have a daughter from from a woman she is not your wife she is not going under this one this verse this verse who forbid you from having sex with your daughter because that daughter 
who came out of the marriage is not considered as a daughter. So he's saying, لأنها ليست ببنت له في أصح القولين. And because she is not a daughter to him, approved by Islam according to the most of Islamic scholar, correct scholar. And the most, وأصح القولين في الدين, the most approved opinion in this case by all the Muslims and the religion. So he's saying, so if there is no relationship by law, by shara, by Islamic law, there is no فلا صهرا شرعا فلا يحرم الزنا ببنت أم ولا أم بنت and because those girls, this girl, she is your daughter from adultery so it's not forbidden for you to have sex with her to have sex with her because she is not considered as your daughter in Islam so you can have sex with her, you can enjoy her in the bed she and her mom, your daughter from your blood and her mom, because she is not your daughter from marriage. As long as she is not approved as a daughter from marriage, you can enjoy her, you can sleep with her, and she is not forbidden for you. And he's saying, and because she is coming from halal, is not going to be forbidden, she is anyway haram. Which means, you know what, this daughter of adultery, she is, she is a whore, you know, and you know, do whatever you want to do with a whore. She's a whore. What a big deal. This is how Islam treat people you can have sex with your own daughter just because she is a daughter out of the marriage just because she is not a daughter from a marriage approved by the religion of Islam she is not considered as a daughter and you will see in here three things four things actually Allah doing to those poor kids they are from adultery number one no inherit for last name Number two, no inherit for money from, their, from the parents because Islam don't approve them as parents for them and don't approve you as a kid for them. Number three, no child support. Number four, in the top of that all, your father, he can have sex with you. You believe it? Is that a religion? I believe not even Satan, he will do such a teaching. And again, this is Al-Qurtubi. This is the official government of Islam. This is not my website. For people who wanna see, you see, this is Al Mamlak Al Arabiya Saudiya, Wazarat Al Shaun Al Awqaf. If you go to the English website, you know, go click at English, you will see there the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Here we go. Here we go. You see it? This is the Ministry of Islamic Affair. Ministry of Islamic Affair. So, this is not my maid, this is not my claim, and nobody can lie and say, this is not true. A Muslim man, he can have sex with his daughter, if she is a daughter from adultery. This is a shame in Islam, this is a shame for Allah to say such a thing like this.